Christine would like to make an announcement about signing the... Thank you. There's a whole large number of people from the community today. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. And if you could do us a favor, there is a clipboard going around for you to sign your name. And if you're not on our mailing list, please put your address and email if possible. We'd love to keep you on our list to let you know about next year's lecture. But the main purpose of this is actually so that we can um, continue getting a grant for this uh, lecture series. So I really appreciate that. And we'll try to get that to go around to everybody um, who's here in the community. Thank you so much. And you know what? I just want to say, you guys are so lucky to have Myrna. Yeah. I'll pay you later. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Truly, this is, a, this is an unprecedented program, and I, I really hope you leave here with great appreciation for what she's done for you. actually have peeps, huh? Okay. Um, a couple of years ago, um, we ran into some difficulty in scheduling. And for reasons that are unimportant at this point, we were not able to have someone who would come in and talk about um, something that I consider to be one of the fundamental, most important subjects that we study. I've told you over and over again in section about talking about European genocides, talking about African genocides, talking about Asian genocides, talking about Armenia, when in fact we stand on hallowed ground and that we are within reasonable walking distance of places where genocide has occurred. And that is why I am so pleased that last year and again this year, Greg Saris, the chairman of the Great Rancheria, has agreed to give a lecture so that you all can know that we no longer should be pointing fingers across the seas but we need to raise our awareness of our own historical complicity in genocide. So it is my absolute pleasure and honor to introduce you to Greg Sarris. All right, good afternoon. Thank you everybody for coming out. I know for students, it is uh, the end of the semester, and you don't like to do much of anything at this point, <laughs> um, right? We can be honest. Um, and for uh, the others of you, I, it's a, kind of a windy afternoon. And for so many of my tribal members who are here and staff members, I'm honored that you're here. You see me in another capacity. They usually see me as a grumpy, mean, fighting tribal chairman. And um, I don't know that I'm any better than, as a professor, but we'll try. Um, Today, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, two things. I'd like to give you some background, some history about the place, and history of what happened. And then I'd like to go back to what Professor Goldman was talking about, about why. Why don't we know this? Why does it continue to be denied? Why does the American Indian continue to be the prick in the American conscience, such that we are either uh, a noble savage when we're defeated and you like us in museums, or uh, when we're not defeated and it's a question of territory, then we're a wagon burner, right? And uh, why are we one or the other? Why are we not, again, human beings with a history, a history that implicates you, me, and everybody? First, let me give you a little bit of background um, and I'm, gonna, I'm fortunate enough to have Lori, my assistant, with us here working the slides. Um, there was never any such thing. The Federated Indians of the Great Rancheria are comprised of survivors uh, from the Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo. That is all native people, um, basically from Southern Santa Rosa Plain down to Sausalito. 
And there's a reason why we got categorized, first of all, as one group, and I'll get to that historically. But first of all, I want to let you know there's no such thing as Coast Miwok or Pomo. Those are made up names, those are linguistic categories that anthropologists and linguistic, uh, linguists classified us at the beginning of the uh, 20th century. Instead, what we were, were many, many people. You're living in an area, Marin, Sonoma, and Lake County had the densest population of indigenous people anywhere in the New World outside of the present site of Mexico City, which was the Aztec capital, as you know. So there were more people here than there was anywhere else in the New World. There were also more languages, diverse languages here, than there was, well, there was only one other place on Earth where you have the same linguistic diversity, and that is in the central Philippines. You had so many languages here, and the old people would speak as many to 10 to 15 different languages, some of those languages as different as English is from Chinese. Now, the Pomo speakers are what we call a Hokan language family, and some of their languages they can understand. Um, the coastal Pomo could understand somewhat, uh, the Kashaya or uh, southwestern Pomo could understand somewhat the southern Pomo, which are us, but then when you get to Lake County, it was very different. Uh, in in Lake County or in uh, Marin County, in here, the Coast Miwok, a completely different language family, as different as English is from Chinese, and yet the people were living side by side and would speak those languages they had to. Most of us lived in, uh, we had villages of approximately 250, uh, 250 to 500 people, and they were in nations. We had separate nations. And Laurie, if you do the first slide, we'll get a sense of the. This is the territory here. Um, of the uh, of, uh, southern Pomo from the Sebastopol area down to Sausalito, the coast of Miwok and Marin County. This is our aboriginal territory. The, all the people in the tribe today are descendants of ancestors from this area. Now, you recognize it with names there. Uh, I don't know if you knew that, of course, Petaluma is a Miwok word. It means slope ridge. It was an actual village about three miles this direction from the present day Petaluma. Now, Laurie, if you go to the next slide, we get a, just a sense. Here are the villages. This will give you a sense of how many villages there were here. And these are all villages of anywhere from 250, 500, sometimes 700 people. These were permanent village sites. They were not, uh, they, people would move around somewhat in the summer, but each person had a locale uh, area. Now, Laurie, if you go to the next slide, and you'll see the nations. These are the nations within the uh, Coast Miwok and then Southern Pomo. So Southern Pomo were comprised of basically four nations. And then when you get to the Coast Miwok, you have nearly 10 separate nations, each nation having had many villages within it. OK? Now, people often ask, there were approximately, at the time of contact, the estimates have gone anywhere from 5,000 to 35,000 people. But if you look at the villages, and Laurie, if you flip back to the villages, these are the villages we know that were inhabited at the time of contact. We've lost a lot of that because of the disruption of what happened. But just based on this, I would estimate that there were about 20,000 people at the time of contact in, in this area here. Now, um, anthropologists and others have said, how have these people lived here for upwards of 10,000 years without a trace on the landscape and basically with virtually no physical warfare? There were skirmishes that would happen. Um, well, the early missionaries, the Padres, thought we were dumb. In fact, they had a big debate um, down in San Diego whether they should even bother converting us when they came north because they thought we were very stupid. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about people and a colonizing tendency is people tend to evaluate other people in terms of what they value, right? So, of course, the most sophisticated natives in this country became the Plains Indians because they had what we understood, organized war cults, right? So they became sophisticated. I would argue that you have so many people speaking so many different languages getting along for 10,000 years, living on the landscape, I would say we had something going. 
But as I like to say, Europeans often have a very difficult time with subtlety, and we were subtle. We would hoodoo you. All right, we had a very complicated system of religion, secret cults. Everybody belonged to a secret cult. We believed that everything was sacred and had power. Power not just that was good, but power that when mistreated, misrespected, could come back and harm you. The Kishaya Pomo called the Europeans palacha, and I always used to, which means miracles in their language. And I always used to ask them, these Southwestern Pomo, how come we, you call well, the white people miracles? And they said, because when the first Europeans started coming, we didn't understand them. They cut down trees, they killed animals, they killed people, they dammed up the water, and instead of being punished, more of them kept coming. <laughs> of course, folks, all we had to do is wait 150 years and realize that nobody got away with anything. It's all coming back on us right now. So uh, what they didn't understand, we, we, as I like to say, the California Indians had a quick, uh, quick system. We got back at you fast. Uh, the European way took a little while, but it, um, once again, a complicated, sustainable relationship with the land. We also had one of the most diverse environments here uh, in terms of water, uh, plant, and animal life, and of course, the coastal life. Um, what happened, um, basically, as you know, the first incursion was the Spanish, and we were affected by the mission system. The first Miwoks appeared in Mission Dolores in 1786 on the records. But in great numbers, they began taking them between 1795 and 1803 into the mission. At the same time, the foreigners' cattle and horses began to spread across the land. So two things were happening. The landscape was beginning to become compromised, and those horses, cows, and sheep carried dung that had seeds in it, oat grass and things that overgrew all the native grasses and compromised the other animals. So immediately the landscape began to be under stress. Also, the native people had no resistance to European diseases. And one of the things the missionaries did when they took us into the missions, and it was virtually a slave system, is they immediately put clothes on us. And um, it's an interesting thing. There was two things that the Spanish forbid. The first two laws, European laws of this land, were a law against burning and a law against bathing. They didn't like the fact that we were burning to clear out, which is what you, we we're now learning that that's what's the best way to maintain a landscape and keep the grasses growing for the birds and all the, the animals that were there. But they also had a real thing about nudity, and we would sweat and bathe every morning and take care of ourselves. Of course, there's a joke. You remember, too, the Europeans at that time seldom bathed. They would put clothes on top of clothes, and that's how they would use cologne. There is a joke among Indian people about how did the term brave come about, and it was the native person who could go closest to a white person. <laughs> Jokes aside, there wasn't um, much really to joke about. The uh, missions, again, began to take us in. Disease was spreading throughout the land. In 1817, Mission San Rafael was built, and it was built as a hospital for the sick Indians. The Indian people in Mission Dolores in San Francisco were dying in droves. They had, were having diseases, and interestingly enough, one of the most prevalent diseases, folks, was syphilis. And as you know, that's not airborne. Uh, we didn't have it here. Um, so the diseases were coming, and what they wanted to do is kind of have a hospital, and they created a Mission San Rafael. There they began to bring in a lot of Miwok people, and they began also to make incursions north. It wasn't just the Padres, but the Padres were working hand in hand with the Spanish colonizers claiming land for Spain. So once again, there was a trail here. Now, one of the things they discovered is that from Petaluma north, the coast we walk were in Petaluma, and then the southern Pomo, where we began to immediately get a reputation as being fierce. They did not want to go into the missions uh, because they started hearing from the people south, it ain't a pretty picture there, right? 
And diseases continued, diseases continued, and um, the separation of men and women at night. Women were locked down in quarters separate from men. Um, there was, of course, the baptism, the forced religion, but most importantly, the, the forced labor. Remember, the water system, the agriculture, and all of that, the Indian people took care of and built for the Spanish. Well, there was the Mexican Revolution, as you know, in 1822, 1823, but, but we didn't have phones or cell phones then, and uh, news traveled very slowly. What happened when the Mexicans got up here, then, so we had the Spanish period, roughly again, keep this in mind, from 1876 until uh, 1834, 1786 to 1834. And the missions were secularized by the Mexicans in 1834. And at that time, they had already been giving out large ranchos, 20,000, 40,000 acres, to favorite sons of relatives of people in power. The governor of Monterey, his nephew was General Vallejo. And General Vallejo, as you know, got a big piece of land here. And he had a home in Sonoma. And he built a fort right over here on Adobe Road, OK? Now, the Mexicans, if the Spanish were cruel, there was uh, not, well, and of course, I, my professor Elizabeth Martinez does not like me to say Mexicans. She calls them Californios. But the Californios came here, and they created, perhaps, became far more cruel, if you can imagine this, than the Spanish. What they did is they established an elaborate slave trading system, where they took all the men and traded them and sold them on different ranchos and as far away as into Mexico. They kept the women mostly as concubines, prostitutes, or wives. And most of us today, if we trace our ancestry back, will see that we are the offspring of a situation there in, in that sort of situation. The Mexicans, again, they tried to go, the, many of the Indian people began to try to go north. The Spanish promised us a piece of land, two pieces of land, one uh, near, to, near Novato, right about here, I think it is, right here, and another one in Nicasio, which is over here. Um, the, unfortunately, we never got the piece of land over here that was near a big village, and we had 500 acres in Nicasio. Many of us went there, but we also had to work. We had 500 acres there, and it was the first rancheria where a lot of Indian people stayed. Um, it was a very brutal period. The Mexican soldiers would come through the villages, take the young girls, and most of the young girls, including my great-great-great-grandmother, Supu, or Maria Cheka, an ancestor of lots of us here, um, ended up right over here in the adobe as a 14-year-old girl where they would rape and keep the girls as sex slaves and other kinds of things. It was quite a brutal period. Uh, 1848, the Bear Flag Revolution, California came in. California created a state, as you know, in 1850. The first piece of legislation in the state of California was called the Act for the Government and Protection of Indians. It legalized Indian slavery in California. Indians became the rightful property of whosever land they were on. All right? That law was not repealed until 1868, three years after the Civil War. So while African Americans, Mexicans and others could buy and own land and were citizens, incidentally. Indians were still being sold in Santa Rosa's Square, the square right where it's there today, uh, every Saturday. Men for $200 and women for $100. And children were very valuable. All right. Um, the, when that law was repealed in 1868, we then went into what we would call the indentured servant period. And at that point, we would live on whosoever land we could take. Often during this period, Indian women would become mistresses or whatever they could become in order to keep their families or their land on property. For example, up north, out of our territory, in the Kashaya Pomo territory, there was the huge Hop Ranch. And Molly Hop was a Kashaya Pomo woman. And what she did is she was the maid slash mistress for Mr. Hop so that the Kashaya survivors would have a place to live. And then he, in turn, would dole out oats or whatever else 
uh, in exchange for favors from her to the people. Here in my own family, Supu, who I mentioned was 14 when she was taken from, the, from Petaluma uh, into Vallejo's fort, she escaped and she walked barefoot up to Fort Ross. And she was 14 and the Indians knew that if they could escape the Mexicans and get up to Fort Ross where the Russians had colonized, the Russians armed the Indians against the Mexicans, not necessarily because they loved the Indians, but it was a territorial thing. And, but they didn't convert them. The Russian Orthodox were very different from the Catholics in that regard. They did keep the women as concubines. Supu um, had three children uh, between the ages of uh, 15 and 18 from a man named Komshitov, and who was what they called, the Russians called a Creole. He was mixed with Russian Aleut and uh, Kashaya Pomo. When the Russians abandoned the fort in 1842, they left the Indians prey once again there to marauding Mexicans and early American settlers. So Supu took her three children, and by the grace of God and wit, whatever else, she went down to Bodega Bay and became the maid slash mistress for Captain Stephen Smith, who cut down all the trees and had the first big sawmill here. All right, she had three or four more kids by Smith, and then, while she lived in his barn and took care of his house, and he had a wife inside, and she named all of her kids, the first three Comchital Smith. Why? Because they were then be considered Smith property, and nobody would steal them or do anything because they had Smith. They knew wherever they went, say Smith, and they would uh, be safe. Finally, in 1922, in the early part of the 20th century, as you can get a feel, What's left at this point from all the villages are a survivor from here and there. And the people today who say we're really not Indians or we're not really a nation, do you see why? We are Indians and we are a nation, but we are handfuls of survivors, people who survive from here or there. Supu was the last one from Petaluma. Uh, uh, Juana Baptista was the last woman from Olampali and Alaguali, from that area, from Nicasio. All right. In the early part of the 20th century, again, many people were flooding in to California. They no longer, though, they didn't have big ranches. They had no longer had need for all these Indians that were still around. And they wrote to the federal government and they said, we've got to do something. So they created the California Rancheria Act. And what that did is it created small home bases for the quote unquote homeless Indians of California. All right, so what they did is they didn't uh, categorize by, by family, language, family, or anything. In our case, they created 15 acres in Grayton for the, whole, and I'm quoting, the homeless Indians of Tamales Bay, Bodega Bay, Sebastopol, and the vicinities thereof. So there was 15.5 acres, only three of which was inhabitable. And some families went there, some didn't. There was continued rape of Indian women, abuse of Indian men that were around, and why did this go on? We were not citizens until 1924. And if you're not a citizen, you have no recourse in the courts. So a woman can get raped and anything can happen. And what happens? Nothing. So many of us claimed we were Mexican and we had Mexican blood. We didn't have some collective security. In 1922, we had that small, tiny rancheria. But unlike the Navajo, unlike the Sioux, unlike groups who had bigger groups of people we had no collective security. We were prey. So we would say whatever we were, however we were, to get by, to be free. Um, during the 20s, 30s, 40s, the racism in Sonoma County and Mendocino County continued. Signs were all over here, Santa Rosa, Sonoma, Healdsburg, Ukiah, no Indians, no dogs, okay? Uh, most of our grandparents saw those signs and uh, experienced that kind of thing. Um, we did what best we could. We hung on. We worked mostly in fields, the fields, labored, did whatever we could. 
our families hung together the best we could. And then in 1858, or excuse me, 1958, Congress says, we're, we, we got all these Indian, little Indian nations and we're responsible for them and they have sovereignty and you know, we, they want food and they want this and that. We've got to get rid of them. Let's, let's terminate the rancherias. So what they did is they passed in 1958 the California Indian Rancheria Termination Act. Now, it was an updated version of the Dawes Act. And what it basically said, folks, is that if the Indians agreed they could own their land. They could have it in private ownership, all right? They would no longer be a nation, a de facto nation that we created, the government created. The government created the Great Rancheria, not Greg Saris, as the press would like you to believe. Um, and um, then what happened is we, they came and they said, if everybody agrees, um, you will own your land in private ownership, you'll pay taxes, it'll be your land. Well, quite ironically, perhaps not so ironic, they came around to the Great Rancheria in August of 1958. There were two or three men there, um, and of course, they, there was federal agents came, and it sounded very good to these guys. It wasn't that the Indian guys weren't stupid or, or, or were stupid or didn't understand English folks. They didn't understand legalese. And when you're explaining to somebody who doesn't understand legalese, would you like to own your land? This will be your land. I mean, those old guys probably thought, finally, we'll have something. So they signed. Um, not knowing, of course, and we lost everything. We lost our rights. And it was illegal because there was not a vote of the entire group. We struggled. We went on. And during the 60s, and I see Frank Creo and others here will remember, uh, they used to say there was no such thing as Miwok. All the Miwok were dead. Supposedly, we were all dead. The anthropologist created the idea of the noble savage. I think Maria Cope and Tom Smith were the last. And after that, um, they all died. Well, the truth of the matter is, in that case, Maria Copa and Tom Smith had quite a few offspring, as we'll find out. Um, but of course, we weren't Indian, I guess. Um, we prevailed, we continued, we worked together the best we could. We knew who each other was. Um, in 1992, a tribe that was recognized up north came down into our territory, into Tomales Bay, and wanted to build a big casino and everything, and included was that was the one thing we had, which is a half acre cemetery in Tomales. That's all we had. And they were going to sit on that. So um, I was just starting uh, as a professor down at UCLA. And I thought, uh, oh my god, uh, I don't want to get involved, in it, but I had to. And some of the elders said, could you come up and let's get organized. It was a wonderful meeting. After 40 years, nearly 40 years, we got back together. Families who'd been dispersed came together um, at a woman at Rita Carrillo's house. And we brought family albums, and it was so heartwarming and a, a spiritual, moving thing to look at. We all had each other's family, pictures of family in each other's photo albums. Oh, that's my aunt. Oh, that's my grandmother's sister. This sort of thing. It went on and on. It was a wonderful thing. So we said, what can we do? And first of all, we wanted to get that tribe out. And we had no rights. Remember, in the eyes of the federal government, we had no more rights or claim to the land because we weren't Indians than a Saturday afternoon card club. But we fought, and um, we scared the Japanese investors in that casino who were feared an Indian war. And uh, they left, and people got out. We then began, folks, an eight-year march to try to correct the wrong. We wrote a bill that we finally got through Congress, and President Clinton signed it on December 20, 2000, acknowledging the wrongs that the federal government did and reinstituting our rights as a recognized federal nation. That was in 2000. This sounded great. We thought, you know, we would be in a good place. Unfortunately, as you may, or some of you may be old enough to remember, um, two weeks later, a guy named Bush came in. Baby Bush, the second one. And there were no new federal monies. Unlike other tribes, we were unable to get a line on the federal budget. 
and uh, we had to keep applying for grants for housing, education, and other things, uh, health care that other tribes, recognized tribes, enjoy. We got the grants, but we had to keep applying for them. And again, it went on and on. Uh, but now we're established, we're on our way, and we've done some pretty great things. But before I go on to the great things and ask the big questions, it's most important, I think, now for you uh, to see the slides and then for me to introduce you to the survivors. Lori, would you show the next slide of the individuals? There's Tom Smith, my great-great-grandfather with two of his nieces in about 1930, um, at about 94, 95 years of age. Um, luckily, he had some great medicine and had 42 children that we know of. Um, and uh, again, his mother was Supu, the last woman that we know of that came from Petaluma, the woman I told you about. He is the child of Supu from Petaluma and the Creole, Kongshital, from uh, Fort Ross. Can I have the next picture, Lori? Thank you. Maria Copa. Maria Copa, a great matriarch. She is the daughter of Juana Baptista, the niece of Chief Marin. So this is Chief Marin's grandniece, Maria Copa. Uh, Juana Baptista was the head, last head woman at Nicasio. By the way, what happened at Nicasio in 1958? What happened to those five, 800 acres? I, I left out a little piece of history. It's the same old story. The city of San Rafael sent a couple officials out to Nicasio, and they brought in three men to San Rafael. They had got them drunk, had them sign away the land, and the next day, they marched all the Indians of Nicasio, all the native people, over the mountains to the coast and left them there. That's how we got to Marshall and lived off the coast. And Juana Baptista, Maria's mother, um, was the head woman at the time and endured that pretty awful thing. And she, uh, Maria Copa, is her daughter and was the last person um, to speak clearly that dialect from the south down there, from the southern regions of Marin. Again, um, uh, an important woman. She incidentally, when Tom Smith used to doctor, she used to sing and interpret for him when he went into a trance. And she called him Uncle Tom. Uh, not the way you might say. Uh, the next slide, Lori. There is my father, Emilio Hilario, with Tom Smith's daughter, uh, Nettie Smith, or Renette Smith. Um, and uh, that was about the time I was created, I think about 1951 or so. And um, that's the part of my family. But now, um, what I'd like is first, would the descendants here of Maria Copa stand up, please? Maria Copa, you know who you are. Stand up. Nina and Frank are first cousins. No, second cousins, actually. Uh, because Frank and Nina's father are first cousins. <laughs> I, I know the family. Would the descendants of the Smiths, of Tom Smith, please stand up? My cousin Linda. Would all the uh, Coast Miwok people please stand in the room now? The survivors, would you please stand? From the Shallow family, Laurel Ross from um, the Great and Rancheria. Here we are. We're still here. We didn't go anywhere. Southern Pomo, too. I'm looking at Jeanette, and Jeanette, uh, we, you know, we get very ethnocentric, the, the certain families, and one of my jobs as a leader is not to leave anybody out, and I better not leave Jeanette or, or, or her mother out. Jeanette, would you stand up? Jeanette is from the Sebastopol, descendant of the Sebastopol. Her mother, her grandmother was Sarah Walker, who was the daughter of a native woman and the rancher Walker from the Walker Road out there. So again, an interesting, interesting history. Um, what happens, what, what happens on and on is again a huge question. Why isn't this told? Why don't we talk about this? Well, it's it's a pretty much an old, old story. First of all, 
The person still in power has the pen and writes the history. Those who have no power don't have the pen and don't get to write the history or tell the story. And as Professor Goldman alluded to in her introduction, it's very interesting how we erect monuments commemorating the Holocaust in Europe here, but where are the monuments here commemorating the Holocaust here? <coughs> and it's very interesting, when I go to Europe and everybody comes up to me and says, isn't it awful what the Americans did to the Indians? Of course, I said, yeah, it was sort of like what they did to my mother's people, the German Jews. Of course, they're just shocked, right? They always want to, they always want to point the finger over the fence. The removal of the Indians here in some ways, it was much more horrid than in other places. It was a free-for-all, where Indians were hunted, they were be scalps were paid for, and so on and so forth. Here, when you didn't have a sense of collective security, when you didn't have big nations of survivors, i.e. the Sioux, the Navajo, the Hopi, and many other folks, what happens is the Indians themselves could had a very hard time walking around identifying themselves as an Indian. They could get raped, they could get sold, anything could happen. So more or less, we had to lead very subtle, careful lives. We couldn't advocate for ourselves. In the 20th century, the anthropologists came along. And you know, the salvage anthropology, they wanted the real Indians. So they found Tom Smith, a woman uh, did her dissertation, uh, a student of uh, Kroger's, from Berkeley did her dissertation on the Coast Miwok, and she says in her introduction, she found two specimens, <laughs> Tom Smith and Maria Coppa. And um, it's a big, fat book, and she got her PhD. And um, uh, Tom, she said Tom was a lot, somewhat addled, but he was BSing her, and the only reason he was doing it is to earn enough money to get a suit to be buried in. And he was a ladies' man, as you might imagine, with his number of children, and he liked looking at her legs. <laughs> <laughs> um, which she said very radically. And Frank's mother was living with Maria Coppa at the time this woman would come. Well, uh, Juanita uh, was living there with her grandmother, Maria Coppa. And she remembers, your mom told me how one day Frank, or uh, Frank, I was going to teach you this, uh, Tom came down and actually slapped her grandmother and said, don't tell her the truth, don't say anything. And your mother said to her grandmother, why did Uncle Tom slap you? And she said, I shouldn't be telling these things. So again, the only thing we had left was our culture and our religion. And uh, we didn't want to give it away. So again, we more or less went underground. At that time, again, the stereotype prevailed. Lo, the poor fallen Indian, the noble savage. Look what happened to the California Indians. They love us now in museums to weave baskets. They love us uh, to talk about nature and how we're into nature. Oh, but when territory and power comes up, call it a casino, we are wagon burners again. That's not Indian. Oh, since when is Walmart Irish? <laughs> you know, like we're still supposed to be going around in a loincloth. Um, so again, the stereotypes persist and the strong tendency now to delegitimize us. They're saying they're really not a tribe. Do you understand why we're not a tribe As in their eyes? Now, the other thing many of my students will say, why don't Indians and black people and Mexicans just get over it? Well, easier said than done. When generationally you have watched your grandmother, mother be raped, when you've watched your father be humiliated, patterns, dysfunctional patterns, patterns, fear patterns, emerge in families as survival techniques. And those things keep getting played out. The alcoholic or drug addicted Indian youth or the Indian youth in a gang is a direct descendant behaviorally and blood-wise of the man who was beaten by General Vallejo, is a direct descendant of the woman who was raped repeatedly by Mexican soldiers. 
This lives on. And as I told, tell my students and I tell my tribal members, what happens is that all of a sudden, dysfunction and fear becomes the only thing we know. And then we start recreating it because it's home. My students still don't get it. I go, OK, listen. How many of you know the young woman who watched her father beat up her mother, say to herself, I'll never marry a guy like that? And that same woman will walk into a room with 100 men and folks, which one will she pick out? The wife beater. The wife beater over and over again. Intellectually, she knows it's bad. Intellectually, we know it's not great to do drugs or mess up our lives or that kind of thing. But emotionally, what we know is home, even if it's dysfunctional, we go. It's hard to break those patterns. It takes work. And the work of decolonizing and uncolonizing our own minds and what we've internalized is hard. It's especially hard when you have newspapers and everything else telling you you're illegitimate. When you have people telling you you're illegitimate. You can disagree with a casino. That's your business. But to attack the people and attack their lives and talk about them, that's not only not right legally, but in the, in the case of this history, it continues to delegitimize us and make us unknown non-whites with no history. And as I keep saying to my people, take the high road. Take the high road. Don't lower yourself. Don't respond. Take the high road. And as my cousin Linda says, I am so friggin' tired of taking the high road, I'm getting a nosebleed. <laughs> <laughs> but as I say to the tribe, some of the chairmen in Southern California, they said, why are you working so closely with the non-Indians? Why are you giving? Our tribe, borrowing money from our investors, has given more money to higher education and environmental restoration than any single or corporate donor in the history of Sonoma County. Didn't know that, did you? <laughs> did you know that the special uh, police unit in Roner Park is funded solely by this tribe? At the tune of a million and a half a year? No. We've got to keep the cowboy and Indian war and make those Indians bad and not let them in the newspaper. Right? Take the high road. That's what we have to keep doing. And then what I was beginning to say is those chairmen in Southern California, they said to me, why are you giving the white people money? You don't owe them anything. I said, yes, we do. And they said, what? I said, we owe them a good example. <laughs> and that's what we have to do. We have to rise up and be the best. And once again, position ourselves to be keepers of the land. And finally, folks, to stop the us-them dichotomy. It's no longer about Israelis or Palestinians. It's no longer about Indians or white people or black people or others. Because the world is in such dire straits, until we all come home once again and share a home and be home, we're not going to make it. And floods and global warming, they're not going to, well, unless you're one of these rel fundamentalist religions that think you're going to go up in a rapture. Um, it's not going to discriminate. It's not going to discriminate. We're all here. The sun, the moon, the stars, the rocks, the animals see us equally. And we have to, again, try to see each other that way. Thank you. Yes, you know what, Professor Goldman, I'm so happy. Last time I heard there was lots of questions, and um, uh, I don't know what happened. We ran out of time. So um, I made sure that there would be enough time, because you may have questions, and I, I'd love to talk to you. Um, so um, questions. Questions. Or as I like to say to my students, answers. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, what, what family are you?
also kept them, uh, and again, what, he, what this man is talking about, he's a descendant of the one or two survivors of the Bloody Island. Up in Lake County, uh, and this happens, you see, down here, but everywhere, but uh, up in Lake County, um, actually what had happened, there was two brothers, the Kelsey brothers, Kelsey Bill is named after them, incidentally. Um, they enslaved over 400, 500 Indians there on their ranch. They kept them in barbed wire pens at night. And what happened is two of the men snuck out one night to get some oats in a barn. And the, one of the brothers came out, there was a skirmish, and the two brothers got killed. Well, that was in a completely other area. And what happened is, they called in the U.S. Cavalry. They started down by Hillsburg and started open fire on every Indian they saw. And they got up there, near Lake County, to a group, to your ancestors, who had nothing to do with this actual thing at all. They were all huddled on the island for protection. They were fishing. They were fishing. fishing. Yeah, they, were fishing. Yeah, they, were fishing. Yeah, they slaughtered them all, and all that survived was one woman and her child who were under the water, breathing through a reed. All the way down the Russian River. Again, this story is ubiquitous throughout California. Um, and uh, in, in fact, in the Nicasio, what was very interesting is there's the story, and I think, Frank, you've probably heard this, about the white owl coming into the roundhouse down there and saying that the people were going to end, that they were going to be murdered. Um, so, uh, and it came to pass. Yeah, this, is, uh, this has happened. But the biggest thing is not just forgiving America or whoever did this, but I'm finding increasingly we must forgive and work in ourselves because we're not free until we're free of that. Um, yes, other questions, answers? Yes, ma'am. What can you do as individuals? What can you do as individuals? <laughs> that is a big question. Um, well, there's many things you can do, but what I would most importantly, I think, is work every way you can to, as this, as this man says here, appreciate life and do what you can to perpetuate life and understanding in whatever you have been given. Each of us has been given a gift. And if it's teaching or whatever, and always remember what the old folks used to say, just remember you don't know everything. You know. For us, uh, our worldview is you weren't the center of the universe, you were just part of it. And one of the dangers, by the way, of wanting to fix things or waiting for it until it gets better, is we still get in that old trap of when I get home, when I get home, when I get here. The most important thing is to be here now and be whole now. And if you're here and whole now, it's catching.
and we need to fix it in ourselves because it's living in ourselves. <laughs> yes, ma'am. But don't worry about us. Worry about yourself. Okay, don't worry about us. I got the floor right there. <laughs> all right, I'm educated, right? And we're here. We're all in this together. We're all here in this together. We know that. But the fact that you just said that, the fact that you acknowledge us, that you understand that, is enough, right? You did it. Uh, you're no better, no less than me or anybody else. We're all here together. If a big wave were to come right now. Um, I might drag a little behind because I'm a little heavier than you. But other than that, it's all the same. Right? It's all the same. Uh, so, but don't worry. Again, we're caught in a weird other thing that happens. And it's a, it's a, it's a mindset. A lot of, I don't want to blame the, my mother's people for starting the story or anything like that. But what happens is you started a story in Western culture where you had a homeless people that were promised a land. And there was always going to be a land, a place over here. And there was always going to be something over here. And then the next wave came and said, no, it isn't even here. It's up in the sky. And then another group came and said, no, it's really up in the sky and all of this sort of thing. Meanwhile, none of us are here. We have a mindset of when I get my degree when the people are equal, when the people get fixed right. But until we're fixed right and stop that paradigm in our head, that kind of thinking, nothing really changes. Because no longer can you deal with the history that's living in you and manifesting itself as fear or anger or whatever it is reminding you that you're not home. Be home. We're all here. Yes, sir. Thank you for asking. To what extent in our territory here are any of the original languages um, still are going on? In the Pomo regions, there's a few speakers left. The Kashaya Pomo, Southwestern Pomo, because of their somewhat unique history, have probably 30, 40 uh, fluent speakers left. The last fluent speaker of Coast Miwok passed away in 1978, Florence Bauer. Okay, but I am really proud to say and there's a woman I know right in this room and a couple people. We, from tapes and working with linguists, once again, we are having a conversation in Coast Miwok. So, uh, yeah, so it's, it, we're reviving the language. Which one? It Coast Miwok. It's, the, well, it's, it's the major. Now, Coast Miwok, there were only th three probably because some of the Coast Miwok people, that language is here more recent, uh, 5,000 years. So there's only, the diversity within the Coast Miwok languages is about the difference between Old English and Modern English. Whereas in Pomo, it's the difference between Latin and Spanish. It's much, it's much broader. Um, so we're speaking actually the Bodega Miwok. Okay. Other thoughts or questions? Yes. Um, yeah, there, well, there's, there's a number of things. The Day of the Oaks, unfortunately, we lost the money for that. You know, m monies and things are drying up left and right. Um, but um, there are numbers of things. We have things. Um, 
And we have events, and just, you have to watch, but there isn't any kind of, there, there are certain things that happen, and I wish there were more things that were open. Now, there are things where Indians are included, like Olimpali Days and some of these other things are similar to Day Under the Oaks. But I'm, sometimes I get a little skeptical of that. I think it's good, but sometimes it's kind of like a circus or a rodeo where the Indians come out and jump around in feathers and then walk back, and you're going, oh, right? What does that mean? What does that do? Well, it, it is, and it has to be careful how it's talked. You don't want blame and that kind of, I mean, you want understanding. You want growth from this and not blame or anger or that, because that doesn't help. That just perpetuates the cycle. But yes, one of the things you can work on, and you can contact our office, we have myths and stories that are written, and we have histories of the areas. There's some good histories that are out, that are coming out, local small presses, um, again, that do this. Um, one of the reasons people don't want to do it because they see it po as political, right? It's political, um, but it's history. And again, as I said, there, it's very good that your mother wants to do that, but contact our office, the Federated Indians of the Great Rancheria, and we'll be glad to put you in touch with any of our activities or pamphlets or anything we have that will be of, of benefit. We also have people who will come to your class, your mother's class. So we have people that go to the class and talk to the students and. Um, we, have, we have quite a good organization of, of, of education of, about the history and, uh, and that sort of thing and the part that we've played in the history here. Um, yes, sir. Um, could we learn something? There's a Santa Rosa author named Red Saris, I think his name is. Um, could we learn anything from his books? Well, I don't know. Sometimes he's a pretty dumb guy, but you could be the judge. He's right in front of you. Uh, yeah, as Mabel McKay used to say when I was getting a PhD, the, you know, it was amazing. Uh, the old Indian doctors, S.E. Parrish, Mabel McKay, those people, and our, all of our elders, they had more wisdom in their little finger than all those PhDs at Stanford. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you that right now. And uh, when, they, when Mabel said, somebody said to Mabel, oh, aren't you proud of Greg? And she said, oh, he's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, there's Grand Avenue, there's a movie, there's the book Mabel McKay Weaving the Dream. I just finished a book of uh, children's stories about Sonoma Mountain, a cycle, and I have another book coming out. So there's quite a few, there's quite a few things that I have done, and including essays, and essays that have a lot to do with pedagogy. I mean, um, you know, there was a time around here where I was sort of the hero, and then, you know, I wrote the books and all that, then the casino comes and I'm the devil. Now the Press Democrat talks about Stations Casinos buying me a job here. Oh. I got tenure in one year at UCLA. I got two masters and a PhD at Stanford in three years. I published six books and have done movies and an endowed chair before I came here. Somebody had to buy me a job here? I love being here. I love being here. But the demonizing is pretty awful. Grant, <laughs> yes. Uh, bibliography of your work? Yes, Lori has a bibliography of work. I've sent you a couple of my essays, I think. Yeah, you have, and I've enjoyed them, and I shared, um, shared them with the students. Uh, students all oh, you've read then The Last Woman from Petaluma and things like that. Great. But I'll be in contact with Lori. Lori, Lori is the, she knows more than I do. I will forward the bibliography. Okay, all right. Thanks, thanks. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Duncan. Uh, which we used to call Sultan Bay when I was a kid. <laughs> Been there for 
uh, what, quite some time continuous there. Um, a lot of people are, yes? So every year at Thanksgiving, people can be at the ferry and get on the boat and go out to office and they apply. And they have enough ferries to just keep taking people out. So you don't have to just like, miss it, you can go. And they have all kinds of uh, traditional people coming from all over to the line. Uh, last year, one of the great speakers was Madonna from the Frank and I, we were there. Um, and it was very difficult for us because those Indians that were there that were claiming it for all of us, mm -hmm. they didn't recognize the Indians who were here. They said that we were a bunch of Mexicans. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's very interesting how these, we all can be very short-sighted. And I can remember, and Frank and others of us who went there, of course, we were young kids, we went there to get in trouble with them. There was a lot of partying out there. Uh, and, uh, um, but I remember that they used to, they liked our girls, but they didn't like the rest of us. And, uh, um, you know, they said that, you know, they were claiming it on behalf of all Indians. But I thought, wait a minute, you're in Miwok territory. <laughs> Did you ask us? Did you have that with that? Yes. Are you sure that's not a lot I think it's a lot of territory. Well, maybe you could split it down the middle. Yeah. Uh, I was there when you went to the play. Yeah. yeah. Or the poem. Yeah. The point is, none of us went on that. Right. That was a taboo item. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like Mount Tamalpais. Everybody goes up there. That's a taboo mount. I love it. All these people go up there to get married. Ooh, I, I say to myself, that ain't gonna last. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, we have a Native American Studies program, a bachelor's degree. Um, there's basically one person in it, Ed Castillo, and myself. I'm kind of a weirdo, and I get in trouble everywhere because I have this endowed chair through the humanities. And everybody thinks I'm in the English department. Everybody thinks I'm in Native American studies. Everybody thinks I'm in philosophy or creative writing. And I, I, it's a great job. It's a wonderful thing being home, being here. I can go anywhere I want. But, um, I'll be whatever you want me to be, but um, uh, I do teach in it. In fact, I'm teaching a course right now called uh, Native American Literatures. And they have their final lecture on uh, Thursday. <laughs> yeah. Again, it's very interesting because a lot of people take that. It's a GE course, and they take it because they think, ooh, you know, Carlos Castaneda, Magical Mystery Tour. <laughs> and, you know, it's real literature. And then, of course, when you get into the issues of the history and the context that the literature comes from, you get some resistance, you know. And, uh, but again, it's a great opportunity. And I, I, the greatest thing for me is to be home and with my family and teaching here. And whatever the creator gave me, whatever uh, gifts, to be able to be here and, and do whatever I can. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm loving it. I'm loving the people of Sonoma County, um, even though some of them don't seem to like me. <laughs> um, I was in, uh, a couple months ago, I was in Oliver's over here, and some woman came up to me and she said, Greg Saris, I want you to know that you are ruining our home. And usually I do take the high road, you know. I usually say, um, you know, go through an explanation. I'm sorry you feel that way. But I was tired that night. And I just looked at her and I said, and you're talking to an Indian. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, Hebrew. Hebrew was a good. I know a little bit about my mother's people. <laughs> I was um, I was adopted. My mother was a uh, folks a wealthy. Uh, you'll get this. Um, my my grandfather was Howard Hartman, the president of the May Company in Los Angeles, <laughs> and um, his daughter Bunny Hartman 
Could there be a, a more stereotypical uh, <laughs> Jewish German socialite's name in the 50s than Bunny Hartman? <laughs> uh, in any event. Fritzy. What? Fritzy. Oh, yeah, Fritzy, yeah. No. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, my father proceeded in the tradition of his grandfather to get five um, non Indians pregnant in high school, my mother being one of them. <laughs> And uh, in the 50s, nice Jewish girls didn't get pregnant, and certainly not by Darcy's. And they, her mother took her up here to hide her out, ironically, in the homeland of the father's people. They didn't know. They didn't know what. And uh, my mother put me up for adoption, and she had me in Santa Rosa Memorial Hospital. And Santa Rosa Memorial Hospital, two days after she had me, uh, she needed blood. She was just 16. Um, and the doctor gave her the wrong type blood and killed her. Oh. And her mother secretly buried her in the pauper section of a Catholic cemetery and told nothing to mark her grave but an upside down horseshoe and told family and friends in New York and Los Angeles that she'd fallen off a horse. And until I came along at 19 and found my Aunt Gertie, my great Aunt Gertie, um, they all thought Bunny had fallen off a horse. And I said, well, you're talking to the horse. <laughs> and. Um, yeah, and I was adopted by non-Indians, and uh, I always thought, the record always said that the father was unknown non-white, because in those days when you were adopting the, an animal, you had to know what breed it was, <laughs> and uh, it was unknown non-white, but it said the father was likely Mexican, a Mexican father. But my mother would never give away his name. He would have been hung at the time. And um, uh, so I always kind of grew up thinking I was this lost half-Mexican kid, and immediately, as Frank and others will attest, I gravitated toward the Indian and Mexican people. We didn't, in those days, say Indian and Mexican. We just all kind of got clumped together. And um, uh, I didn't know anything about what I was. And uh, then I found my mother's family. Her mother was still alive. Um, and my uncle, who was a school teacher. And um, they weren't particularly happy. Um, my great aunt Gertie, my grandmother's sister, was wonderful. As she said with, in her in, inimitable Jewish wit, she says, honey, I'm a woman of seven operations. And if I had known about you, I would have taken you anyway. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, um, she, and she said, your mother, my grandmother was quite a, quite, a, quite a mover. She went to Hollywood to become a movie star after Juilliard School of Music. Her biggest role was being the beard for Randolph Scott while he was living with Cary Grant. <laughs> then she took a job in the May Company selling jewelry, and down the aisle walked the president. She nabbed him. So of course, uh, of course, the joke is, uh, and uh, they said, Jewish and Indian, how can that be? And I said, well, it makes me a smart savage. I get the savagery from the Jews and the smarts <laughs> from the Indians. <laughs> I'll never forget a Jewish man came up to me, and he says, I just want to tell you, I found that very offensive and anti-Semitic. I said, sir, it was a joke. You're not very smart. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. I want to ask you now, uh, would you talk a little bit about what's happening right now, like especially in Mendocino County, with the Mexican cartels, particularly out in Cobalo, where the story is they pretty much taking over all the people on the web. And what is similar to what's happening now in that regard as to what you were saying when the Mexicans came here and took the people? Okay, we've had a long history with the Mexicans, and as you may not know, also with Filipinos. Many of us, especially in Lake County, you know, which you've got so many of them across the Filipinos married today when they came over. Um, the cartels, I don't know a lot about this. I don't know, I've heard of it, that the Mexican cartels are up in Mendocino County, and I don't know a lot about that. I will say sadly, and this I do know about here in Santa Rosa, that many of our native youth are in Mexican gangs, Serenos or Norteños, most of us, right? And they are in gangs, and that's again an identity thing. We understand it. What are these gangs, these kids saying, I am somebody, see me, know me, right? In fact, Recently, there was a murder, and many of you know about this, in the downtown, uh, across from a club in the, in the parking lot. Well, the father was Mexican. The three young people, they're all Indian. Okay. There was a murder in Petaluma, um, or uh, itself, because I remember the 17-year-old 
some Latino, supposedly. His ancestors came from Olam Holly, five miles away. Okay, he was identified as Latino. So again, what's happened is they're unfortunately, in two ways that I can see, we're getting involved with the, with the Mexicans, the, the bad influence, it's drugs and gangs. And I wouldn't be surprised in the rural areas where they're growing pot and doing this sort of thing, that on big reservations, I be Polo, where they would employ the people. But I don't, I don't have first-hand knowledge of that. But it doesn't surprise me. Employ the people, as I am hearing it from my friends on the Lake Bill this, would not be the right description. You're basically enslaving the people again. Like they're, I was told maybe before murder a month out there by the cartel, letting the ladies know we're in charge. And if you don't play it just the way we deliver it, this is what's going to happen. And that they do that just to contain and let them know. And when I'm hearing what you said today and what I've heard before, like uh, from Anne Marie Sayers and people down in the Long region uh, with the ladies that way, it's the same, it seems to me, it's just like you're saying, I have those patterns repeated. And it's being repeated. Yeah, um, I don't, I want to be careful about blaming anybody. Okay, and I don't know. I don't know, I can't respond to that because I don't, I don't know. I do know, I, my sense tells me that if three or four people were being killed a month, there would be a little more press about it. No, there's no press. You can't get press in them to see about that story. Okay, I don't know. Yeah, I do know. Yeah. All right. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I'm sorry. I, I, that's, uh, yeah. Yes. So, would you join me in thanking...